Well, good morning everyone and welcome to our Climate and Water Update webinar for Winter 2019. For those joining us for the first time, welcome. And for anyone who joined us for our webinars before, welcome back. Today we'll be discussing recent climate conditions over winter, also the Winter 2019 outlook for temperature, rainfall and stream flow. My name is Angela and together with Caroline, we are going to job share the roles of moderator and producer for this webinar. Hi, Caroline. Hi, Anne. How are you? <laughs> Good, thanks. Today, um, or rather together, we will help make the webinar as interactive as possible. But before we begin, may I ask for your attention as we cover off some housekeeping items. Our broadcast today will run for 60 minutes with plenty of time allocated for questions. This webinar is also being recorded and the video will be shared with you by email. For first time webinar attendees, please see some helpful tips on your screen. Most importantly, please note the chat box where you can send through any questions or feedback for the presenters. Please use this and not the Q&A box to send your questions to us during the session and we'll answer as many as we can during the allotted breaks. If you want to test out the chat box now, feel free to tell us your name and where you're dialing in from. I'll also take this moment to thank those of you who have sent in questions uh, for us during the registration process. We have developed the content of this session in accordance with the common themes of those questions, so thank you for engaging with us. And finally, I'm delighted to introduce to you our presenters, Robin Jewell and Jonathan Pollock. Hi Robin, hi Jonathan. Hi, Anne. <laughs> Robin has a strong interest in helping people to understand the complex science, finding new ways to interpret and make climate science understandable, usable and accessible to all Australians. She has also worked as a weather forecaster for the Bureau in Darwin and for the UK Met Office in England. Jonathan joined the Bureau of Meteorology as a weather observer, launching balloons, sounds fun, watching the skies and recording the weather. Later, he moved into climate information services, providing historical context for the current weather and guidance on the months and seasons ahead. Welcome, Robin. Welcome, Jonathan. We are really looking forward to hearing you from today. Um, so, Robin, would you like to let us know what you'll be covering? Thanks, and so the topics that we're going to cover today, uh, we're going to give a wrap up of what's happened recently in autumn, uh, then we're going to look at the outlook for winter. So we're going to look at the rain rainfall, stream flow and temperature outlook, and we'll try and put this into a bit more context with how this might affect drought, bushfire floods and snow. And then we'll finish with talking about what's driving the outlook, why the outlook um, looks the way it does this winter. So let's start with recent conditions first. What's been happening in the last couple of months? And I thought rainfall was probably a good place to start. So this map here is the autumn rainfall deciles. The blues are where we saw above average rainfall and the pinks and reds is where rainfall has been below average. So if we look at the north first, uh, we can see it's been mixed. So over Queensland and parts of the Northern Territory, which were affected by Tropical Cyclone Trevor, we saw um, very heavy rainfall and flooding there. And also Tropical Cyclone Veronica impacted parts of the Pilbara as well during autumn. But elsewhere in the north, it was very dry. It was a very dry end to the wet season. And in fact, it, the whole wet season was very dry for, for many parts away from Queensland and that Pilbara coast. Down south, um, in the southeast in May, there were some well-timed cold fronts. Uh, but in other areas, and a lot of our key agricultural areas, um, it was very dry across autumn. So particularly along the coast, the east coast in New South Wales, uh, in, in Tasmania in the east, and large parts of South Australia, and particularly in southwest Western Australia. Um, you can see there that uh, along the, the far coast there in the southwest of Western Australia, we saw record breaking low rainfall for autumn. 
Uh, in that part of the world in May, you usually expect to see quite an increase in rainfall there as we move into the wet season. This May um, was extremely dry um, in southwest Western Australia. So it was the third driest May on record, the driest since 1964. Um, since the start of the year, Perth has seen its dry start to the year on record. So that's a very long record that goes back to 1876. So it's been particularly poor in that area. In terms of temperature during April, um, we can see lots of yellow and oranges on that map. So overall, this is daytime temperatures. It was warmer than average in many locations. Uh, in the Pilbara and Kimberley, it was record-breaking warm. Um, they've had some very unusual hot days, especially during um, May. The, the exception is in Queensland where we did see a lot of rainfall um, associated with tropical cyclone Trevor, um, and that rainfall kept temperatures lower there. But um, people living in the south would notice, especially in the southeast, that it turned very cold and wintry in the last weeks of May. So there were some cold spells in the south and also notably in Western Australia. Um, during May. In mid-May, there was an ex uh, some exceptionally cold weather and it was very cold at night. So there was um, some places that saw their coldest May nights on record in southwest Western Australia there. So although we do see lots of orange and yellow on this map, there were some significant cold spells during autumn in the south. So turning now to soil moisture, um, the soil moisture around the country is quite mixed. Uh, where we saw a lot of rainfall um, in Queensland, there we see very high soil moisture and some of the areas in the east and southeast which did receive some good rainfall during May, soil moisture there is closer to average or above average. But again, in some of our key agricultural areas and in particular in southwest Western Australia and the east coast of New South Wales, and in eastern Tasmania, soil moisture is very much below average. And again, in the north, those areas that didn't see a good wet season, the soil moisture there is, is very low as well for this time of the year. If we take a closer look now at water storages, there's a lot of information on this map. Um, each of those little diagrams there, the white line graph shows the level of the water storages for those regions over the last three years. The bucket shows where water storages are now and the red line shows where they were this time last year. So if we just talk about a few of these, um, you can see in the Gulf of Carpentaria up the north there, you can see that normal wet season dry season discharge and recharge during the wet season and water levels are quite high. They're at 93.4%, same as they were last year. Um, that's mainly due to tropical cyclone Trevor. But it's a little bit of a different story as we look at other parts of eastern Australia. So if we look at the northern Murray-Darling Basin bucket there, we can see that water storages are now down at 7.1%. So that is exceptionally low. That is lower than at any point during the millennium drought for that part of the world in terms of water storages there. Um, as we go further south, at this time of the year during autumn, you usually expect that normal drop off in water storages that you see in summer to slow and stop through May as we get that southern rainfall coming in and wetting up catchments. Um, but this year we've seen a continued drop during May at most locations. So if we look at the Murray-Darling Basin south, you can see a slight bit of an uptick there. So those cold fronts that came through in the end of the month there and brought rainfall have started to, to stop that decline as we would usually expect. But in many locations it, it's been a late, um, it's been very late that we've seen this rainfall come in during autumn. Um, Rob, I'm sorry to cut you off there. There's a, a point there from Rob. Rob Rob's asking, what about South Australia? Um, so I haven't put South Australia on this map um, because we do monitor so many locations and I couldn't put them, fit them all on the map on this occasion. But we do have a link down the bottom there. So if you follow the link, you'll be able to um, 
follow through and have a closer look at your location because it is quite variable depending on, on where you are and what the weather's been recently. And we did see it quite mixed, so it does vary across the country. So check out that link and you'll be able to take a closer look at your location. On a technical note, they may the links probably won't work while the webinar is live, but they will be sent the presentation and the recording yes, afterwards. So thank you. Can link oh, thank yep. you, Caroline. I didn't know that. Um, okay, to wrap up, um, so this autumn uh, it was warm for most, but there were some significant cold spells in the south. Rainfall and soil moisture was very mixed depending on where you are, um, but many agricultural areas uh, remain drier than average for both rainfall and below average soil moisture. Water storage and stream flows, um, although some places are fared okay, in most locations these remain low, um, especially in parts of the south. Uh, the picture that I've put in here is of a dust storm which affected Mildura. Um, in May, so that's exceptionally late in the year to see a dust storm. Um, that just reflects how dry the landscape was um, and how the first two months is, when we look at that overall map of April, it can look like some places, especially in the southeast, have done okay, but it was exceptionally dry for the first two months of autumn and that's why we had these dust storms so late in the season. So that's where we're sitting right now in terms of what's happened recently. But before I hand over to Jonathan to talk about um, the outlook, we're going to do a quick poll. We are going to do a quick poll and I apologise when I updated the slides, um, some of that poll question didn't make it onto the slides, so there you go. <laughs> um, for anyone who can't uh, read that, it does say which of the following information is most important to you and the answer choices there being uh, A, long term average winter rainfall, B, what rainfall there is. Um, uh, what rainfall there is a 75% chance of exceeding, uh, C, the likelihood of winter being wetter or drier than average, or perhaps D, other. And um, if you do see the poll there on your screen, so please select um, from A to D, whichever is applicable. Uh, perhaps if D is the answer, you might also like to tell us in the chat box what it is you'd like to learn more about. So we'll leave that poll open for a few moments uh, until everyone's had a moment to engage with us. We do have a question that came through uh, as uh, your presentation was in progress, Robin, so I might um, ask that of you while we wait, if that's okay. Um, the question there is, uh, is the extremely dry May in South, Southwest, Western Australia an indication of the severity of IOD influence that South Australia may be impacted in winter, spring? Oh, that's a very good question. <laughs> um, so I'm going to talk a lot more about the Indian Ocean Dipole a bit later, so I don't want to give too much away. The Indian Ocean Dipole, though, is generally a winter and spring phenomenon. So it tends to develop in winter and strengthen in spring. Um, an Indian Ocean Dipole generally can't exist at other times of the year because we have the monsoon trough in the mm -hmm. Southern Hemisphere and that doesn't allow that circulation to build up. And at the moment we're not in an Indian Ocean Dipole event. Although we're going to talk later about what might happen with the Indian Ocean Dipole. So there are some indications that we will see an event develop this year. So what has happened so far in autumn in South West Western Australia is not likely related to, to that. Um, but we have had um, a lot of higher than usual pressure across um, across the south during um, the autumn, which has tended to push those cold fronts and troughs that we'd normally see further south. Mm -hmm. um, and there can be varying reasons for that to happen um, as well, but it's generally this high pressure that we've seen. It's been persisting really for a very long time. Um, it's not just autumn, which has been below average in many locations. For, for some locations across the country, it's been um, over two years now since they've seen fairly consistent below average rainfall, um, which is largely due to this, this persistence of high pressure. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Robin. That question came through from Simon. Thank you, Simon, for engaging with us. I think we're probably about ready to close the poll. What do you think? Or we have? No, not yet. We're closing the poll now. Um, 
And, okay, a couple of seconds left on that one. Uh, we'll wait that one out. And at the moment, it's looking like our answer choice C is uh, the most popular one. So does that surprise either of you? <laughs> Um, the likelihood of winter being wet or dry than average? No, that's, that's usually a popular one. Anyway. Yeah, <laughs> I imagine so. Um, all right, so we're going to share those results with uh, the audience there at home and hopefully you can now see the, uh, the answers or the, the breakdown of those on your screen. Um, so yeah, as I, as I said, um, answer choice C was by far the most popular, although we did get a few others uh, as well. So we might check out um, if anyone left us any comments there uh, in the chat box. Keen to hear more about reasons for persistent high pressure in recent times. So that's come through from Jolly On. Thank you, Jolly On. No, that's a really good question. Um, so in so many places, so especially parts of the east which have been in drought for quite some time now, and it's still ongoing really, like some people may have had some temporary relief from time to time. Um, so when we have a period of drought, at the end of that we tend to do a big review of um, what are all the causes, but some of that research is underway. So it's somewhat a research question, but we do know a few things. Um, in that with climate change, we know that associated with climate change is, um, is this idea that the subtropical ridge, which is that, that high pressure belt that naturally sits across southern Australia, which is the reason why we have dry summers and wet winters, is growing in strength mm -hmm. um, and, and expanding. Um, and so when that happens, that means we have less cold fronts potentially reaching Australia during um, during winter and spring, um, but also we have a lot of natural variability as well. So we've had some near El Nino-like conditions, which we'll talk about more, but that can also result in lower than usual rainfall. Uh, so they can, when, when we see this happening for a long period, it, it cannot always be the one cause. It can be a contribution of natural variability, but we do know we have this underlying issue with climate change and that the subtropical ridge is is potentially getting stronger and more intense. So it's, it's still a research question, really, um, and people are looking into that in, in more detail as to what the causes are. Thank you, Robin. Uh, there was another note here from Stuart. My interest is largely around potential grain harvest, so a connection of potential rainfall to potential soil moisture is of interest. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Stuart, for letting us know. And we'll move on with the presentation now. And Jonathan, you're looking after us for this section. Thanks, Ange. Yeah, I'm going to speak to everybody about the climate outlook, so what we might expect in the coming three months. So the winter outlook, that's the large map on the left-hand side there, is showing that much of eastern and southern Australia is likely to have a drier than usual winter. It's also showing you uh, that Western Australia has roughly sort of equal chances of, of a wetter or drier winter for most parts. You'll also see that Northern Australia has a lot of that brown to orange shading indicating a drier than usual season too. But, but typically in the tropics now it's the dry season and we generally have very low rainfall in those parts sort of regardless. There's three other maps on the slide. So down in the bottom right hand corner, that's a map showing you what you would typically receive during a winter with regard to rainfall. So showing us, yep, that parts of northern Australia typically would have very little rainfall or no rainfall at this time of year. And the largest falls falling down over Tasmania and southern parts of the mainland. Now just above that map in the top right hand corner is a map that tells us about the past accuracy of the model. And this is something we've had a lot of questions about. So the areas that are, have, have the dark green shading or the green shading, they're areas where the, the model has performed quite well in the past. It has high accuracy at this time of year. And so the areas that have the, the beige shading, so that's sort of parts of New South Wales and, and Victoria and South Australia, in those areas, the model hasn't performed as well at this time of year, so forecasts for winter. And you'll see on the, the, the following slides that I show that we have accuracy maps for the other elements too. And that the accuracy pattern changes across the country 
um, and at different times of the year. So looking back again to the large map on the left hand side, so even though we've got the, that, dry, that dry shading down much of eastern and southern Australia, it's still not a guarantee that we're going to have a dry winter or a below average winter. Some of the odds in those parts are, are sitting between 30 and 40 per cent. So we wouldn't be surprised if some of those areas did get near average rainfall or even some parts above average rainfall. But really what it's showing us is that overall, over a large area, that eastern and southern Australia, we would expect that winter 2019 is going to end up being drier than average, drier than previous winters. Now we can break the winter outlook down into its monthly components. So on the left hand side, we've got a map for June. So this is showing us what the, the one month rainfall outlook is. In the middle, we have a map for July, and then we've got the same map for winter again on the far right-hand side. And now below each of those outlook maps is an accurate, as a corresponding accuracy map. And what you'll notice is that the accuracy maps for the one-month outlooks, June and July, have a lot more of that white shading, those areas that don't perform as well, compared to the three-month, the winter outlook map, which has a lot more of that green and dark green shading. You'll also notice that the pattern um, in the June outlook is pretty similar to, to the, the winter outlook, where we've got drier conditions most likely for parts of eastern and southern Australia. But you can see that that doesn't extend as far as it does in the winter outlook. On this slide, we've got some examples of two other forecasts that you can find on our Climate Outlooks webpage. Now, all of the forecasts on the Climate Outlooks webpage use the same model to generate their forecasts, but each of them is slightly different and can give us slightly different information. So on the left-hand image, you'll see a map, and on the left-hand side of that are some options. And we call this map our Outlook Scenarios. And we have three Outlook Scenarios, a 75%, a 50%, and a 25% scenario. And what these maps can show you is how much rainfall you're likely to get for each of those levels of chance. So for a three and four level of chance, right through to only a one in four level of chance. And the maps show you how that pattern changes across Australia. So parts of the north um, have a, their 75% chance relates to much lower amounts of rainfall than they do in the south. And if you click on the map, the map's interactive, you can actually search for um, your own location or your particular point of interest to find out how much rainfall or what, what the minimum amount of rainfall you're likely to get for either a 75, 50 or 25 percent level of chance. Now on the right hand side is another forecast we've got and this forecast we call a chance of at least. And on this map you've got options to choose from different levels of rainfall and then you can find out what your chance is of receiving that amount. So in the example here, we've used Briagalong down in Victoria, and you can see that for Briagalong, their chance of getting a, at least 100 millimetres during winter sits somewhere in between the, um, the 45 and 55% range. Oh, sorry, I beg your pardon. It's sitting, yeah, it's sitting somewhere between that 45 and 55% range. And you can see that those, those um, chances change across the state. So there's parts of the south, parts of the south that have sort of uh, a slightly increased odds, and there's parts along the Alps uh, which have a much greater chance of getting that 100 millimetres. And then all the way up in the northwest, those parts of Victoria have a much lower chance of getting at least 100 millimetres over winter. So that can help people make decisions based on certain rainfall amounts, rather than just the chance of above or below average rainfall. Now, this slide gives us the streamflow outlook. Now, the outlook, current outlook is from May to July, so that's not the, the, the winter months. And the other thing um, to remember is that this outlook is using some of the data from back in April, and we've got a new seasonal streamflow outlook um, due out any day now. So before that arrives, some of the best guidance you can get for, for streamflow is the, the link to the seven-day streamflow forecast there. But what that outlook was showing us was that from May to July, 
for most sites, low to near average flow was the most likely outcome. And really, it was just parts of eastern Queensland where most sites were likely to have near median or above average flows. Now, looking at the temperatures for winter. So on this slide, we're looking at the maximum temperature outlook, what we might expect during the day times. And on the left-hand side, you can see a, a very red-looking map. And what that's showing us is that most of Australia has a very high chance of having warmer than average days this winter. On the bottom right, you can see what average daytime temperatures are like during winter. And, and, and not surprisingly to most, they're warmer, warmer in the north than they are in the south. And above that, in the top right-hand corner, we have the accuracy map showing you that for, for most of the country at this time of year, the maximum temperature outlook it has high skill, so high accuracy. Now we have some maps for the minimum temperature, for the overnight temperature outlook for winter. And you can see that our, our large map on the left-hand side that is, isn't quite as red as the, the daytime maximum temperature map was, but there's still parts of Australia that have a very high chance of recording warmer than usual night times. However, there's also a large patch of, of, of inland Australia, inland New South Wales, southern Queensland, the interior of South Australia, where the chance is, is pretty close to 50-50. So you've got roughly equal chances of a, of a cooler or warmer than average night times. And you'll see the corresponding accuracy map there in the top right hand corner. And again, for most of the country, we, ha we have uh, medium to high accuracy at this time of year. But there are parts that have low accuracy. Um, so that's something to keep in mind if you're trying to use the forecast in those areas. So what does the outlook mean for some of our significant weather over winter? Well, the outlook for drier than normal conditions in the east and south means that in some parts uh, that have had rainfall deficits or have been in drought, that might in fact, that, that might worsen. The, temp the, the outlook for clearer nights or for lower rainfall translates to clearer nights in some parts, and that's probably going to increase the risk of frost in susceptible areas. Winter is still the, the sort of the time, the coldest time of the year, and a time when a lot of southern Australia gets a lot of rainfall. So flooding is always possible in winter, even with a, a drier than average outlook. But what the outlook, um, what the dry outlook does mean is that we wouldn't necessarily expect widespread flooding. And the Northern Australian bushfire outlook yeah, will be released soon in the coming months. Uh, and that'll be able to provide some guidance on, on areas of the north that have higher or, or lower risk than usual for bushfire in the coming season. Ah, excellent. Thank you, Jonathan. So we have reached our first Q&A session for the webinar, ladies and gentlemen. So we invite you to please send through any questions you have of our presenters. And uh, we've already received a couple, and just while we give people a moment to get involved, uh, one of the themes, um, or rather the, the recurring question that we seem to receive during the registration process, and I suspect is on people's minds at the moment, is about rainfall, how much and when, and is there any reassurance that either of you can provide to our audience who are perhaps in, in a situation where it's a bit of a life or death, if you will? Um, it's a good question, and I did so. I did see those questions that were submitted earlier, and it's a really common question. Sometimes people want a little bit more information than just is it likely to be wetter or is it likely to be drier. Um, so the thing with forecasting is uh, people get confused too. I think as why we can do a seven-day forecast, but say not a forecast for day eight, but then we can do a seasonal forecast. And it all comes down to that trickiness in forecasting the weather. So the longer you look ahead, the more difficult, difficult it is to forecast. But you can forecast certain things with accuracy still a long way out. So we can give a very specific, precise forecast. So this week we can say, for example, on Wednesday it will be 19 and rainy in the morning. Um, but if we look further out a month ahead, we can't be that specific with accuracy. 
but there are still things we can say with accuracy. So we can forecast the likelihood of it being wet or dry in the season ahead. But unfortunately, we're limited with the science in being able to say exactly when that rain is going to fall and how much rain is going to fall. So we know that's a really common question and we'd love to be able to give more detail, but sometimes we just can't because we're limited in the science and we just stick to the things we can do with accuracy. But um, as Jonathan was showing earlier, we do still have some more information that you can glean. So if you've got a specific amount of rainfall you're interested in, say 25 millimetres, you can use that forecast type Jonathan was displaying before to get a probability yep. of that happening. And we can give reliable probabilities, yep. um, but we can't be as precise as exactly what will happen on what day when we get out that far. So I understand the question and we're always doing our best to give as much information as we can, but there's just some limitations there as well in what we can do with the science and the complexity of the weather when you go out that far. Thank you, Robin. Well, um, hopefully that resource does help people a little bit, at least by, you know, helping with the probability side of things. So um, thank you again to those of you who've submitted questions in advance of the webinar. Um, now for some that have just come through. So Jasper was asking um, or mentioning that it would be great to hear more about the correlation between rainfall expectation and expected windiness. So, ah, that's a good question too. So, um, it's actually a tricky question. So, I say all. <laughs> 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 yes, okay, that's okay. So, there are things we can forecast with lots of confidence, like rainfall and temperature, that when we get to other various variables like wind, they're harder to forecast. But there are some things that we know. So the, one of the reasons, which I'll talk more about in the next section, that we're seeing an outlook like this is um, because it's looking likely that we'll see some action from climate drivers like the positive Indian Ocean Dipole and El Nino. We know in those situations we tend to get more high pressure, which is why we're seeing that dry outlook. When you see higher pressure, um, that means inland we gen generally see winds that are not as strong as usual, but, you can, but it can be very variable on the location. So um, it can change the direction of the predominant wind depending on where you are. Um, and um, if you're further north, it can have impacts on sea breezes. So there are, it's, it's probably a good one to maybe submit the question because it's very location specific. So. Um, Later on, we're going to have a, a link to an email address, so you can always submit questions there and we can try and follow up with um, additional information after the webinar for that one. But it does depend on where you are. Thank you, Robin, and thank you, Jasper, for asking or making that point, rather. Uh, Andrew's engaged with us. Andrew says, uh, over the last three to four months, the outlook for New South Wales has oscillated between 50-50 wet-dry and mostly dry. As per current outlook, can you explain why? Um, again, it's related to this persistent high pressure that we've been seeing over the Tasman Sea, and we've been seeing this. It's been ongoing. Um, for a couple of years now, just this persistence of higher pressure than we usually would. Um, and as we talked about before, there, there, very, there can be very reasons for this. Um, uh, and partly we've been hovering their ENSO thresholds, um, El Nino thresholds, which can, um, which is likely to have had some El Nino-like impact, which is lower than usual rainfall. Um, we've also just been, um, in general, just having that underlying increase in pressure. Uh, I, I talked a little bit about this in the last webinar. It's quite complex, but we've had a lot of warm water in the Indian Ocean, um, which can cause, which has been causing persistent low pressure there. And what air goes up must come down, and a lot of that has been coming down over eastern Australia as well. And that's um, that persistent warmth in the Indian Ocean is likely related to the higher pressure that we're seeing in Eastern Australia over this period. But that's something that our researchers are really trying to understand the full complexity of that and why that's persisted for so long. 
Thank you. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we do have very high attendance numbers today and we do have a lot of questions coming through, so thank you. We do apologise uh, in advance if we don't get to your question, uh, but there is opportunity to engage with us after the webinar as well. We'll provide you with an email address. We'll take one more question now and then we'll let the presenters uh, move on with the next stage of the presentation and we'll take some more questions towards the end. So Dean, Dean mentioned that it would be good to see the August outlook as well. Uh, so that's related to um, how I was talking about the amount of precision we have the further out we go. Yeah. So um, while we have skill forecasting across a three month period, um, when we, we do have skillet forecasting across a shorter period, one month for um, June and for July, but when we get out to August, if you looked at that skill map, there'd be lots and lots of white on that skill yeah. map. Um, so we just don't, our model doesn't demonstrate enough skill to be able to forecast a period that short at that far out at this point in time. All right, thank you very much to all of you who have asked questions. Shall we move on for the moment? We'll take some more questions soon. Yes, thank you, Ange. Okay, so we, I've alluded to a lot of this already about what's driving the climate. Um, so that might help make this bit a bit faster because I've talked about some of the topics. Uh, we know that there are lots of things that drive the climate in Australia. And we could actually do a whole webinar where we talk about each of these, these sorts of drivers and the detail and how they influence Australia's climate. Uh, some of them only have an influence in um, some parts of the year and not other parts of the year. And sometimes all of the climate drivers are very silent and we're just up for a bit more chaos and, and, and local features that might impact the weather. But today I'm going to talk about two of these drivers because these are the two drivers which are driving the outlook on this occasion. So our climate model is a dynamic computer model, so it implicitly models all of these drivers. Um, when we get an outlook, one of the first things that we do is we go and we interrogate that model output in a little bit more detail to see where the influence is coming. So this time we're seeing an influence for winter in the Indian Ocean and in, in the El Nino and in the Pacific Ocean. But it can change and it changes all the time. This is just what we're expecting this winter. So for those of you um, that are not completely up to speed with what an Indian Ocean Dipole is or a positive Indian Ocean Dipole, I've put a, a little diagram here. Pretty much what we see in this situation is cooler than usual water to the northwest of Australia and warmer water near Africa, where water is warmer, the air rises and you get more cloud and rain. And as that air is all coming up, it has to come down somewhere and it tends to come down over near Australia, which means that we get um, finer weather and drier weather. So this sort of circulation changes um, the, the paths that fronts and troughs often take across southern Australia and we usually see less of them than usual. And as I mentioned earlier, the Indian Ocean Dipole is a feature of winter and spring. Because the monsoon trough is in the southern hemisphere over the tropical Indian Ocean in the summer months, this sort of circulation can't exist in the summer months. In terms of El Nino, this is um, similar but in the Pacific Ocean. But during El Nino, we tend to see warmer than usual water away from Australia again and cooler water near Australia. You see that focus of cloud and rain away from Australia and there's less moisture that can be drawn over eastern Australia, so it tends to have an impact on eastern Australia. El Nino is a little bit different to El Nino in that it typically starts to, fall, oh, sorry, the like Indian Ocean Dipole, as it typically, it can last a bit longer. The monsoon trough is behaves differently in the Pacific Ocean as it does in the Indian Ocean. So an El Nino tends to form during autumn and winter, peak towards the end of the year, and then decay in the first quarter of the following year. So El Ninos or La Ninos can last longer. So what's happening at the moment? This map here is actually from our model and it's a model forecast. So it's not what's happening now in the ocean, it's what our model is forecasting will happen over winter. Now, if we look at the Indian Ocean first, 
we can see that there is a temperature difference across the Indian Ocean where we're seeing more pinks in the, near Africa and we're seeing a lower temperature. Now we don't necessarily have to see pinks and blues, we just need a temperature difference to start up a circulation. Uh, so that looks quite positive IOD-like. And if we look in the Pacific, we see an El Nino-like pattern. It might not look exactly like that concept diagram, but it looks a little bit El Nino-ish. Um, if we take a closer look at the Indian Ocean first, we can see our model forecast of, this is an indice which measures the strength of the Indian Ocean dipole, and the black line is the current observation, so we're not in an event now, but that green line shows what the forecast is, and the forecast from the Bureau's model is that it's very likely that we'll see a positive Indian Ocean dipole event during winter and you can see it decaying there as we go into the wet season as the monsoon trough comes into the southern hemisphere. And on the right, we can see that it's not just the Bureau's model that's forecasting this. On the right, we're showing the output from other international agencies which have supercomputers which model um, the Indian Ocean dipole so we can get a bit more supercomputing power by seeing what other fellow agencies' models are forecasting. And we can see of the six models that a forecast Indian Ocean dipole, five of those, and most of them quite strongly, are indicating that a positive IOD is likely to develop in the coming months. So what does that typically mean for Australia? The map there shows the, the typical rainfall pattern that we see during a positive Indian Ocean dipole event. So it's typically less rainfall than usual over central and southern Australia. Uh, with less rainfall, we often see warmer days because we have um, more sunshine hours and we also often see warmer nights in the southwest with cooler in the north. You can also see a shorter snow season during positive IOD events with lower snow depths, but we'll talk about snow a little bit later on in a bit more detail and you can see an increased fire risk in the south. So in terms of El Nino, we can see here that our model has been hovering near El Nino thresholds for some time. This is a measure of the temperature of that ocean in the central Pacific. Generally, we need to see oceans warmer than this to see the atmosphere respond and to see those widespread changes in rainfall across Australia. So we haven't seen yet a sign that the atmosphere has changed. It's been a little bit El Nino-like, but we haven't seen a full El Nino develop. If we look at the forecast, the green line, the Bureau's model is indicating that most likely those um, temperatures in the ocean are going to cool to levels that are, are not consistent with getting a widespread response. If we look at what other models are forecasting, we can see of the eight models that we look at, most models are like the Bureau and they're indicating that we'll see some El Nino-like attributes in the ocean, but probably not enough to see those widespread changes in atmospheric circulation. But some models do forecast that it's possible and a couple of the scenarios from the Bureau's model do indicate it's possible. So it's still a plausible um, thing that could happen, that we could go into El Nino, although the odds are against, against that happening on this occasion. If you remember back to that positive IOD plot, there was a lot more certainty and strength in the forecast for the positive IOD. It's the dominant driver of the outlook. Um, for winter. So in terms of El Nino, what do we usually expect? expect? It's a bit like the um, positive IOD, less rainfall than usual. Warmer days in the south and a longer frost risk season. So if frost is something you have your eye on, this cannot be good for frost and we do see less chance of widespread floods with El Nino during winter. So, for those of you that might want to know a bit more detail about snow, I'm going to hand back over to Jonathan and he's going to talk about the snow outlook. Thanks, Robin. We have a lot of questions about the snow season about this time of year, which is pretty, pretty understandable. So I thought I'd put this slide in and I've put it in after we had a chat about the climate drivers because I think that'll, that'll be helpful too. So we saw the outlook before and it was for, for dry and warm conditions. And so automatically, some people might assume that, that that's probably a bad for the snow season. But it's more complicated than that. 
So in Australia, the snow seeds are highly variable. We see a big differences in maximum snow depth from year to year. And quite often, it's not just the climate influences that, um, that kind of shape a snow season. Single weather events can really make a big difference to the amount of snow cover. And we also find that, that early snowfalls don't give us much of a guidance for how the rest of the season is going to play out. Now, there's sort of two competing forces at work here. So both the Indian Ocean Dipole and El Nino um, typically mean lower natural snow cover over southeastern Australia. But at the same time, both of those things, the positive Indian Ocean Dipole and El Nino, when we have those, they typically improve the conditions for snow making. So at the same time as we might have less natural snow cover, we might have increased or better snow making conditions. And there's a chart on the right hand side of this slide that sort of illustrates that. So what we've got there is on the left hand side, maximum snow depth measured in centimetres. And then we've got the different years coloured in for their different classifications. So we've got a bunch of El Nino years, a bunch of years when ENSO was neutral, and all the years when we had La Nina. And we can see that between the differences between that, that red bunch of X's, the orange bunch of X's, and the blue bunch of X's for, for ENSO phase, and also for the Indian Ocean Dipole phase. And so for El Nino and positive IOD, they're the red X's. And you can see that, that in that set, we have some of the lowest maximum snow depths for some of our seasons. But we also have a lot of seasons in those red columns that are getting pretty close to average. Um, we also see that for the blue columns, the La Nina and negative IOD, that they actually don't, don't necessarily improve conditions for natural snowfall either. It's, um, well, sorry, for La Nina either. It's really it's the neutral ENSO years um, when we have some of most of our consistent snow cover. But yeah, the takeaway from this is even though we've got a, a dry and warm outlook, it doesn't necessarily mean we're going to have a bad snow season. Thank goodness for that. Um, for those of you who enjoy your snow sports, it's uh, good news on that front. That brings us to the end of the technical presentation, but we have another Q&A opportunity now, and we welcome any last-minute questions that you might have. Please send them through in the chat box. Um, thank you both for uh, your time to present today. It's been really interesting. We've had some great questions come through from our audience as well. One here from Bronte. So Bronte is saying the forecast IOD positive looks to mostly remain below plus one, positive one. Does this indicate the strength of the event at all and how large the rainfall impact could be? Uh, okay. Um, so that is quite a, so what we're seeing is quite a strong signal there. So maybe if this is a, an index, so maybe don't get too hung up on the numbers. So I think about 0.4 is where we look at um, the threshold for an event. So one is quite a bit above 0.4. Um, so uh, with the Indian Ocean Dipole, when we see a forecast like that, if that eventuates, we, we would expect that we could see quite a big impact from the positive IOD, and that's what we're seeing in our model outlook. So it's quite a dominant influence there, and our model is predicting that it's likely to have quite a strong influence on the winter rainfall this year. Thank you for that. And uh, another question here from Bronte. Could the El Nino threshold have had an impact on the rainfall also, or do we only see this when El Nino is reached? Well, we can get impacts from, from ENSO before we reach thresholds for either um, El Nino or La Nina. So it can happen. But this year, we haven't really seen much of a, con um, a, a convincing response from the atmosphere um, to those warmer sea surface temperatures. And so typically, we would expect to see coupling between the, the atmosphere and the ocean to get those sort of those global impacts from an El Nino. Great. Thank you, Jonathan. And we'll take one more question now and move on to wrap up this presentation. So our next question has come through from Andrew. And Andrew's asking, how relevant is the MJO through winter? During May, we had some rainfall in New South Wales. Um, when 
uh, sorry, when um, is that when May? Well, that MJO was oh, when in MJO was in five. quadrant four or five. Sorry. Uh, uh, so the MJO uh, predominantly has its strongest influence in Australia over the summer months. Um, in in our winter um, months, it tends to be more a northern hemisphere implication. It can um, increase the chances of uh, when, when we have a, an event move through the Australian region, so that's when we have more cloud and rainfall moving across to the north of Australia. If that coincides with a, a cold front coming in from the south, it can increase the chances of moisture coming down across the country. So it's, it's possible that when we had an active um, MJO in the region and we had cold fronts coming in from the south, that enhanced rainfall. We did have, um, just in recent weeks, so during May, we actually had, so a thing like the Manjuling oscillation tends to influence weather on short time scales, so on weeks rather than those months and seasons. Um, the southern annular mode is another thing that tends to influence on those shorter time scales, so we don't always focus on, on them when we're talking about the long seasonal outlook. Southern annular mode is a situation where we see um, those bands of um, uh, storms that come across the south moving further towards Australia or further away. So we did, it did look like recently we had um, a bit of a, a negative SAM and that means that um, over southeast Australia it did make it more likely that we'd see more fronts and troughs coming across and that is what we did see in the last few weeks of May. We really did see a change to that normal wintry weather that you'd expect at this time of the year during May. So um, often it, it's very easy just, I mean, it, it's very, these drivers all act together and they're all related. So sometimes it's, it's not a good idea to say it's just caused by El Nino or just caused by the MJO or just caused by SAM. But we did have a, a bit of activity with the MJO and the Southern Annual Mode, which likely helped enhance rainfall in May in the southeast. We also had similarly related a question about the subtropical ridge and whether that has any influence over the, or whether whether you use it as part of the seasonal outlook. Well, as Robin said before, so we use a computer model uh, that, that's trying to represent the globe and different layers of the atmosphere of the oceans. So that, that model intrinsically uh, um, captures those drivers. So it does, we don't have a, there's not a discrete part of the model that just looks at the Indian Ocean Dipole or at ENSO or the subtropical ridge. That's all captured in, in the physical processes of the ocean and the atmosphere and the interactions between them. Perfect. All right. Well, who would like to take us through the summary? Jonathan, over to you, or back to you rather. Thanks, Ange. So to summarise, the winter outlook is showing us that um, above average temperatures are very likely during the daytime for almost the entire country. And night times too, uh, there's an increased chance of, of warmer than usual winter nights for most parts. Um, below average rainfall is likely for much of the east and parts of the south as well. Uh, you can see those odds do range though. Um, so there are some parts uh, that have a slightly reduced chance and others where the, where the chances are, are much lower again. So not a guarantee of below average rainfall, but we expect that 2019 will overall come in a um, bit below average. That means that in those parts where they have had rainfall deficits or they've been in drought, there is an increased chance that that will continue. And the, um, the clear nights and some of that the still weather we're expecting means there's an increased chance of frost in susceptible areas. Now you can get plenty more, plenty of more information uh, about the upcoming seasons from our website. So there's the Climate Outlooks website, and most of the uh, the forecasts that we've looked at today are, come from that site. But we also have a Climate and Water Outlook video, and this is a great way to get a summary of the outlook and the recent conditions. The ENSO wrap-up is a web page that provides a lot more technical detail on what, what's happening out in the Pacific Ocean, what are the current observations and, and what the forecasts are for the conditions there. The drought statement is a routine report that the Bureau um, publishes showing you parts of the country that are in rainfall deficit for different periods, different amounts of time. We also have seasonal stream flow forecasts 
and we had a quick look at those earlier. So they give us an idea of stream flow uh, levels for the coming season. And also, you, you've probably seen this on social media. Um, you can check we're on Twitter and Facebook. And if we didn't get around to answering your question today, please do email it in, um, and that'll help us shape the next webinar, and we might even get a chance to, to answer it directly. And you can subscribe to our e-alerts as well. Thanks very much. Fantastic, thank you. All right, well, our next webinar, um, if you could jump us across to the next slide, thank you, Jonathan. Our next bomb webinar will be on the uh, will be on Thursday, the 18th of July, and we'll be providing listeners with an update on drought conditions. So, uh, a registration link uh, can be accessed via the chat. Caroline will pop that in there in just a moment if you bear with us. But also, after this webinar has concluded, we'll send you further information on how to register. So this brings us to our webinar for today. Uh, as Jonathan mentioned, please get your questions to us at helpdesk.climate at bomb.gov.au if we did miss it today and it's a burning question. A big thank you to Robin and Jonathan for your time in developing the content today and sharing your knowledge with us. To our audience, thank you for tuning in and joining us today. We hope that you enjoyed the session and we do hope you'll join us again next time. If you'd like to continue the conversation, please use the hashtag BOMWebinars in your LinkedIn post. As mentioned earlier, this session has been recorded and we'll be sharing the video uh, with you and have that ready for your on-demand viewing pleasure in the next few days, so please watch this space. Finally, but most importantly, we want your feedback. It's our aim to bring you the highest possible quality webinars, but we can't do that unless you share your experiences with us. Once we close this webinar, a short survey will pop up on your screen and we'd be very grateful if you could complete that anonymously for us. Once again, thank you for your time and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Goodbye.